All right, all right, all right. It's almost that time of year. The time when I set the foundation for supreme and total dominance at my fantasy football draft. How can I be so confident? Because I use the ultimate draft kit from the fantasy footballers. Man, it updates all off season. So I never worry about using old busted information. Consistency charts, auction values, full projections. Oh baby, this thing's got it all. You want to keep it 100 for your draft? Head to ultimatedraftkit.com and get your copy today. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Coming to you from pristineauction.com studios with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. All right, all right, all right. Welcome in. <laughs> Welcome into the show. Thursday, May 30th, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast back again. Mike is here, Jason present and accounted for. I am Andy Holloway. Brooks, he's twisting the knobs and pulling the levers. Uh, he's back there doing nude bongos. In really? Honor, in honor of our Good friend of the show. Every year when the Ultimate Draft Kit releases, Brooks finds a need, mm -hmm. uh, finds it within himself to disrobe, play the bongos, and <laughs> scream for a couple of hours. So if you hear the... Blah, 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 that's yeah. that's Brooks. <laughs> Brooks, how are we doing? Are you able to do the bongo thing and the producer thing at the same time? Oh, yeah. Awesome. It's awesome. An, it's an oh, exciting yeah. time. That, it's I've an never exciting heard, time. I've never heard Brooks more excited yeah. uh, about anything on this show mm -hmm. except the time that we tossed him a nude bongo joke. Yeah, he was in on that. Yeah. T 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. Will play. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> welcome in. Got a great show prepared for you. A good uh, quick question. I think you guys will like my answer to it. And then... Uh, oh, I do. In celebration of the Ultimate Draft Kit, we've got the Ultimate Draft Tips on the show today, breaking down some very interesting, astute insights gleaned, pulled from some of the data inside the Ultimate Draft Kit. Well, the, what's great about it, we're, we're showing how we use it. The Ultimate Draft Kit, yes, it has our rankings, it has our full projections, but this thing is a research tool. I mean, we talk about it all the time on this show. We want you to be involved in the decision making. It's the game of fantasy football is not fun if we say, "Hey, play this player," and you just, "Oh, sure," click, put him in the starting lineup. I mean, we want your brain thinking about the the game, thinking about the analytics, trying to find the trends and the edge. So that's that's part of why I am personally so proud of the Ultimate Draft Kit. Somebody can jump in there, literally never look at my personal rankings, which. It, you should, because they're really, really good rankings. Far better than a bongo pay, playing monkey <laughs> yes, would but, rank players. But you could just – there's so much substance it, to dive in for the research. Well, and, and these these tips today that we're giving on the show, this, these aren't just from the draft kit. These are from our months and months and months of diving deep. And right. Like, this is where we've been living. We've it, been living in this data. Really, really cool insights, ultimate draft tips on the show today. This is your last chance to pre-order the Ultimate Draft Kit at ultimatedraftkit.com. It releases on Saturday. Yes. Saturday, June 1st is the release date. This is the last chance for the discount. You get five bucks off to pre-order. I mean, that's the discount. So I will your say last this. chance to do it. If we Very could, excited. Very proud of what our team has done. If we could get a hold of the, the calendar man or the calendar gal, it's really unfortunate that it has to release on a Saturday for us trying to run a business. <laughs> like, could we just make sure that June first is always a weekday? I'm gonna look. Into I that, thought. Mike. See, I thought you were going a different direction. I thought you were going to officially petition for June first to be made a national holiday. Which I would you also really <laughs> should have gone. I accept that as well. So we're gonna get into some of those uh, insights, information. It is the number one question we get about. Ultimate, the ultimate draft kit each year is how do I practically use this to right. equip myself for the draft? So we'll address that on the show. Follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. 
You can uh, watch the show on YouTube, youtube.com slash the fantasy footballers. Fortunately for you, Brooks is behind the camera. Mm, Fortunately for will, us all. For us Except all. Except for me. Yeah, <laughs> staring Jason. right towards the camera. You're Jason welcome, is Jason. the least fortunate Impressive among us. work, though, Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Baskin Robbins paying off. Um, here's the quick question for the day. Who have you been changing your opinion on lately, player-wise? I mean, uh, this is a long off season. There are lots of different yep. pieces of information, and uh, coaches like to talk the talk about their players, and the, the draft has happened, and um, opportunities have uh, risen for players based on injuries. You know, people going down, Isaiah Crowell. Mm, uh, I like the use of the word opportunity oh great so you want me to start yes i do <sighs> let's be clear say it my opinion it! on this player has changed not on his nickname say it david opportunity yes! yes, there it is david montgomery running back rookie Ch rookie running back from the chicago bears i have uh, uh, been the lowest on him on the show not because i dislike David Montgomery, it's simply the fact that I had a belief, have a belief that, you know, it's going to be a uh, a multitude of running backs used in the system. That being said, when you look at the landscape of NFL teams and opportunities, as you would call them opportunities. This is why he got the nickname. Um, there's just a lot of available carries for David Montgomery in Chicago, and that's not the case for every player. Now, someone like Miles Sanders, I think there's only 30, 40 carries available when you look at who got carries last year and who's still on the team. Now, someone like Miles Sanders will take a bunch of opportunity because the players that took those carries, they, uh, Suck. they're they not good. You know, it was a, a matter of – and what, one of the insights that I'll bring up later in the show <clears throat> focuses on this component of market share, right? How much market share – did different players take out of the backfield? But David Montgomery just has an enormous opportunity because of Jordan Howard's absence and because of what skill sets Tariq Cohen and, and um, you know, the incumbents there have. And, and they brought in Mike Davis, and I've brought that up. And I don't know if consistency will be the name of the game for David Montgomery in the first half of the year. But everything presenting in Chicago – says that the second half of the season looks like it's David Montgomery's for the taking. He has to do something with it, but it's his for the taking. And the fact that he can catch the ball, the fact that there are so many carries available to him, my opinion is changing. I have warmed. He has moved up my rankings a little bit. So David Montgomery is uh, my my choice. For I'll... Uh... I'll step to the plate next since I'm going the other direction. To this the plate, is, huh? Look, when the I plate? saw his name in there... I was so confused. It's like, how could you possibly rise this guy up even more in your rankings? No, no, no. It is, in fact, the opposite. It's a player I've been cooling on, someone that coming into the offseason, reading and researching everything I can from Tennessee beat writers, from the general manager and the head coach and the offensive line coach and the running back coach. It's going to, and I, and I believe it will be, the Derrick Henry show. And so I was very high and bullish that what we saw last year, and, and really if you look at the career of Derrick Henry, it's been subpar for 90% of it. And then the last portion of last year, he was dominant. He was a fantasy champion winner for people. And, and so I came into this offseason pretty bullish on him. I still believe he will get the role. But as I... Uh, statted every player out, every team, looked at uh, play rate, which is so important for fantasy football, is like how many plays are each team going to get? What's their speed of play? Look, the more you want to run the ball, the f more the clock will run and the slower your pace of play, and they're going to give him a lot of carries. But Derrick Henry's not going to be as involved in the passing game as any other back with you know those high level of carry counts other than maybe Sony Michelle. And this is not a team that I expect to score a ton of points. This is not a team I expect to have a fast pace of play. 
So if they're a, a slow down, try to, you know, they Mike Vrabel as a defensive minded head coach, they want to run the ball, have good defense. They don't have a great quarterback in Marcus Mariota. He's going to get think, 270 plus carries. I, <laughs> I, that's what I've got him down for. I, I think that Tennessee fans right now would be very disappointed in the way that you're talking about that team. Of course. Saying that their quarterback's no good, saying that their offense isn't going to score a lot of points. Um, Mariota's fine. But, He's just not great. But I think that the bigger point of what fantasy owners need from running backs is interesting here because very few running backs in football had a higher percentage of their team's receptions than Deion Lewis did last year. He is the pass catcher on that offense. They're not going to scheme Derrick Henry to catch the ball. That's not going to change. When you give 80%, 78 79% of all receptions from the running back position goes to one guy. So he's capped in that regard. He has to score. Yeah, and I, look, I've got him down for nine touch, touchdowns, 270 carries. When I put these numbers down, I was feeling really good about Derrick Henry. He just didn't end up as high as you thought? And then I look in a PPR or a half PPR. I mean, look, if you're in a standard league, great. But keep in mind, you still, you know, look, if you don't get receptions, you don't get receiving yards. So it still matters in a standard mm, league. That's how that works. That is. Uh, but, yeah, he's been falling down. My, you know, in my opinion, I was bullish on him. Now I'm like, eh, okay, I'll, t I'll take Henry. I think he'll get work. But I don't think he can be a top 10 back this year. That, that was going to be my next question. So not in the top 10. Mike? So the player I am rising on, and, and this is not a – I did. <laughs> Jason, Jason, just breathing. Calm Go down. On. Will this help, Jay? Carry on my wayward son. It helps a lot. Doesn't help my cool setup that I had prepared. Whoopsies. It's all right. It's Carry On Johnson. Oh, really? And this is, it's not like we were, I disliked him. We just He was a great player, a, a strong running back too. I'm just coming more and more to to terms with and being okay with the idea that Carryon Johnson could end up as a top 10 running back. And it's precisely for the exact opposite of what you were talking about with, with Derrick Henry is you forget how involved Carryon Johnson actually was in the passing game. And how good. And how good he was. He was averaging four targets a game, if that's just across the entire season. And that, that doesn't even then take into account the ebbs and flows of, well, Garrett Blunt was the primary running back for the first few weeks of the season. He was really splitting time. It, so that, that number can even go up. I certainly don't expect it to go down, but if it's just four targets a game, that's 62 targets. I mean, that's sensational for a, a full-time leader of, 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 the, of that running back core which I fully expect Carryon Johnson to be that. So just adding in the fact of I've you know even though we're in this every day you you forget things like how involved in the passing game Carryon Johnson truly was and he's a special player. It certainly doesn't help that the team is coming out and saying oh, they are, we're a running team. We're a bunch of strong dudes. I don't necessarily agree with going with that for your offense in the year 2019 but that's where they're going. That's what they want to be. And the leader of that will be Kerryon Johnson. Then add in Stafford always dumps the ball off. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm, I'm coming to the place where the upside of Kerryon Johnson is going to be well worth his I'll, average draft price. Well, I'll take you by the hand, Mike, <laughs> and I will welcome you aboard. What's funny about it is to come out and say, this is a running football team. You have to understand the context of the Detroit Lions. This is probably the worst running football team in the last 20 years. They were even... But they now were, they got daring. They were dead devil. last in rushing two of the last four years. Now, last year, I think they were 23rd, yeah, what which year is did, like a huge improvement for Detroit. What year did Barry Sanders retire? <laughs> I mean, this has been... So to say you're a rushing football team, the, the statistical evidence... Look, it's one thing to say it, right? Like, Seattle said it, and then Seattle did it. Right. Uh, Detroit needs to say it and then do it, um, and it has to move the chains. If they can move the chains, then carry on will be able to sustain that level of expectation due to touchdowns. You're also going to need – you don't have concerns over Theo Riddick? No, I, I don't. But Riddick will be there. He'll he'll do his thing, but carry on is going to be on the field yeah, I mean, so much. It would and, be nice to see a healthy season out of carry on. And, and establish like, himself. To your point of 
you got to be able to do it. I mean, with that offensive line and carry on Johnson's skill set, I think they could have success being that type of a team. Yeah. All right. We are going to skip news today. We don't have a big uh, bunch of stuff to say. You Buck don't want Allen, to talk about Buck, <laughs> Buck Allen signed with the Saints. Why? Because uh, that's what people do, Mike. They In the offseason, they sign with different teams. No, but I'm not asking Buck Allen why he signed with mm. the Saints. I would love to sign with the Saints. I'm asking the you Saints, know why? what are they doing? Pass protection experience. That's what I believe. I believe he will not be on this team. <laughs> okay, well, that is a different take. Uh, <laughs> He's little, there for now. A little bit of hype train news about James Washington dropping uh, 15 pounds. Mm. Uh, okay, there you go. People, people. I wish me, I was so. <laughs> <laughs> and people ask me like, so is wait, is it, do you like that? And and I've because I've been a, a vocal proponent on this show of I like when my wide receivers gain weight. And I like when running, running backs back. lose weight. Yeah, I don't like when a wide receiver loses. Weight. Generically, that's true. But I, you know, I I pointed this out like he's he played built pretty like big. a yeah. running back, and he looked like he needed, you know, his his size. He was, sure. Yeah. I think I, I genuinely think this could be good for James Washington. If uh, it's good for his abdominals, yeah, it's good. For, They're very protrusive now. He's down a, a belt size. He's he's very happy. <laughs> um, if you haven't checked it out, check out the Sleeper app. Great platform for redraft, for dynasty, for keeper leagues. Always improving. We're going to be doing our listener league on Sleeper this year. It's going to be great. And uh, without further ado. Tips and tricks. All right, it's time for some ultimate draft tips. Tangible, practical, real insight. Pulled straight out of the ultimate draft kit, which releases on Saturday. Get in there now or tomorrow if mm. you want to get it at the lowest possible price. This is the final push before it's out. It's available. And mind you, if, you, if you've used it in the past, we listen like the number one thing we do as a company is we want to improve this core product and make your draft experience better. The two things you really wanted, which we really wanted, but hadn't been able to get in until this season were custom scoring. So now you can, you can modify scoring settings. You will get tiers and rankings specific to your scoring settings and be able to save them in there. And the other one is mobile uh, a mobile app for both iOS and Android. So you will have a better mobile experience. You will be able to bring it on the go and enjoy it, uh, you know, in your pocket. Yes. And putting a UDK in your pocket, eh, nothing better. Nothing better. All right. I'm going to kick it off, guys, and I'm going to pull some insight straight out of the market share reports. Now, Mike, uh, this is one of your babies inside mm -hmm. the Ultimate Draft Kit, breaking down uh, all the market share numbers for running backs, for wide receivers, it's very interesting when you look at data and you look at the percentage of carries or receptions a player gets in proportion to their team totals. Three names I want to bring up out of this. The first one is Kenyon Drake. Yes. Last season, Kenyon Drake had 34%, just 34% of his team's running back yardage. It's like he was behind an infinity stone or something. Correct. Frank Gore was uh, impeding Kenyon Drake's rushing yardage last year, just 34%. 78% of the team's receiving yards. Yeah, he was a monster through the year. What this means to me is that there is not just a big opportunity for Drake on the ground. That's evident, right? When you look at that evidence and see what Frank Gore did, but it is a great opportunity for Kalen Bellage as well. That is a large percentage of running back yards available. Now, there has been turnover at the head coaching position. But what I don't believe, and I know you guys do, I, you're all on board the Kenyon Drake train, and I think that there is great opportunity for him. But I also believe that in the NFL, more often than not, what you are is what you are. And just because a new head coach is coming in and Mr. b -hole's not there, I don't expect Kenyon Drake. <laughs> I don't expect Kenyon Drake, and I am laughing because apparently I – you, you don't want to talk about Infinity Stones and Mr. B-Hole no. at, at a high rate of speed. So <laughs> apparently there was uh, – Jason was enjoying himself over here, and I couldn't help but laugh because he had to share it with me. He put the Infinity two and Stone two together. was put somewhere, and I don't <laughs> – We do not condone this, Jason. It's Jason uh, at his best. 
But yeah. my point is that I think there's great opportunity for Kalen Balash. That's the real huge takeaway for me. I think Kenyon Drake uh, will get more opportunity in the running game than he had last year. But Kalen Balash is capable in the running game and the passing game. There is a lot of opportunity on that offense. So that's takeaway number one. Here's one that I thought was uh, – and do you want to respond to that at all? I, I see the opportunity as – I mean, what what you found is obviously a, a huge opportunity, but I, I think it goes to Kenyon Drake. When you've got someone who already has a good percentage of the target share at running back who now has the opportunity to possibly – now, maybe, maybe it is Kalen Blush. But if Kenyon Drake comes in and grabs more of the running back rushing share, that's how you get a top 12 back. It's is, true. Is a back that has both. Well, and I think that makes Kalen Blush a very valuable sleeper opportunity there too. Peyton Barber. Here's a very <laughs> a very interesting takeaway from the market share. He was 100% a workhorse last yes, year. Yes, he was. He accounted for 61% of his team's running back fantasy points, which is ninth most in football. But even more impressive, 83% of the running back yards. That is fourth in the NFL. Peyton Barber. When you read the names, That's so funny. Peyton Barber doesn't belong That's in your mind. That's just so funny because he didn't have a lot of yards. No, <laughs> he, he didn't. Such, like, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers could <laughs> not run the ball. You know who didn't have a lot of yards? Ronald Jones. Ronald, Ronald Jones. Jones, which a bit of a hype piece came out today on Ronald Jones, by the way. Um, yeah. Peyton Barber was also fourth in attempt percentage, so 79% of total attempts. The dude. Did they really <laughs> want to do that to him? Is the One of my, my points is I don't think they wanted – I don't think they sat out and said, you know what? We've got our Saquon. We've got our, our, our Todd Gurley on this team. His name is Peyton Barber. We want to give him 80% of the running back work. That is a product of not having options. So I think what it, it says to me is that those numbers aren't, aren't going to sustain percentage-wise for Peyton Barber this year, and there's an opportunity for Ronald Jones. Yeah, and if he already had it. They might. He had it. And he didn't do much with exactly. it. Exactly. And so he, you got best case scenario for Peyton Barber last year from a percentage of carry standpoint. He he can't possibly go up. And statistically, as far as tar market share goes, he is going to regress at a market. Yeah, at in a market, a market share. share. Yep. Maybe the offense is better, and so it works out. And very positive news out of camp on Ronald Jones from coaches. Very positive news today from Jameis Winston. Which coach? Because I did not see the, the Arians. The news, was about. it Bruce? Yeah, okay. Yeah. And the news today was about Winston and talking about Rojo's confidence level and not looking over his shoulder and playing fast because they didn't invest draft capital. Well, if he looks over his shoulder, there's no one back. He needs to look forward because that's, that's where Peyton Barber is on the depth chart. That is true, but the point being they there's didn't – no one behind me, guys. They didn't invest draft capital. Well, that's the point. The point is there's no one behind him. <laughs> if they had spent a third-round pick on another running back, Rojo's confidence is sapped because he was drafted high, didn't perform – and then is looking over his shoulder. Instead, he's got Andre Ellington, who didn't even play last year as his as the backup at that position. Great opportunity for Rojo. Yeah. The last one I want to bring up is Corey Davis because when you look at his market share in the passing game, <laughs> it's very similar to Peyton Barber. <laughs> when I was when I put in his his numbers, I was like, "What? No, this 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 doesn't make any sense." I remember you pointing this out. It was <laughs> until you break down. The actual passing production of the team. Seventh highest target percentage in it, football. It doesn't make sense. Ninth highest number for percentage of teams total wide receiver yards. Yet he only had four <laughs> top 24 weeks. So he was near the top of the league in terms of basically metrics that say Corey Davis dominates the wide receiver yes. position for his team. He is, for all intents and purposes, a number one except for he was not good mm -hmm. for fantasy purposes. So you look at that and you say to yourself, am I going to buy the lie? And the lie is that Corey Davis can get better. And it's a lie because Corey Davis had four top 24 weeks with numbers that, that would have put him in the upper echelon of target percentage and receiving yards. You add A.J. Brown. You add Adam Humphreys. You built this team around... Derrick Henry at the end of the year when Corey Davis wasn't good at all, not that he was good much of the other time, but he was really not good when Derrick Henry was getting 4,000 carries a game. Corey Davis is a unmitigated bust this year. Here, here's the thing. 
Titan fans, so far, you're not enjoying yeah, this. You're yeah, you're not enjoying this at Sorry, all. Tennessee. For, two, look, I think you're going to be good as a team, though. That's what I was going to point out. You're, 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 you're not, you're not going to be good for fantasy. You're not going to want these players. Derrick Henry's going to be all right, but you're not going to be good for fantasy. But you, you could make the playoffs. You, oh, yeah. you're a solid, you're a solid team, and you got the NFL draft. So I hope you went and had a good time. <laughs> The people, people the often, city of Tennessee. People yes. often ask, uh, you know, like, how do I go about making a trade offer? Well, if you're trying to trade Corey Davis, I suggest using his market share numbers. <laughs> oh, that is true. You can craft a trade narrative very well. You could. Um, but, I mean, look, this is a team that has been 9-7 and seven for three straight years. They're a good team. Their defense got better. Mm -hmm. I think that they are a very good team, but... Fantasy wise, That's, you are you're you're grasping at you're saying this team might make the playoffs, so I they must have great players right. to, for my fantasy team. The slow pace of play really matters for fantasy, and I think that you're gonna see that again in twenty nineteen. So those are my three takeaways from the market share reports. There are many more to be had. It's just very interesting when you get into the numbers and say, Wow, mm -hmm. Corey Davis had that percentage. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, one of the one of the things that I, f I feel like it either gets overhyped or underhyped, you know, strength of schedule. We've got a strength of schedule in the ultimate draft kit, and we don't just go, was it a good team or a bad team and how are they facing? We take a look at last year's schedule, this year's schedule specific to the, the teams of the divisions that they happened to play. We look on a positional level and try to project things forward to have a good strength of schedule. But we've often said strength of schedule is not the most sticky stat. Right, you. It's just one of those things where well, there's turnover at the on, on defense. Exactly. Um, I mean, look at look at the Falcons. The Falcons entered last year with a good defense, and then week two came, and you knew well they had so many injuries, they're no longer a good defense. So on the season, it's really hard for me to say I love this strength of schedule at the running back position, but there is a place that I personally in my drafts always look at it. I prefer looking, and we break it down. We break it down for the whole season. We give you that data. The playoff weeks, which, again, those – a little early, but it's, – It's a little early to know how those teams are going to fare, but I love the early season schedule, the weeks one through four. And where I factor this in the most is defense, like not like defense special teams. When, you've still got to draft one. We don't talk about it a ton on the show. You know, there's not as much research and – fun things to look at when it comes to which defense do I pick so okay who are the good defenses Chicago Minnesota you know I'm gonna I'm gonna grab the big great defenses at the top of my draft Jacksonville and then but the reality is and we say this every year like it is it is better to stream your defense yeah. off the waiver wire and play the matchup much more so than trying to get a great defense and playing them week in and week out because Good defenses, when they go up against a great offense, usually the great offense wins from a fantasy perspective. And that's not always the case, but I would rather play a bad defense against a really bad offense than... Yeah, or a mediocre defense, or one that's set up to succeed because they're at home two out of the first three weeks of the year against mediocre offenses versus saying, hey, I'm just locked and loaded. Yeah, I'm just going with Chicago no matter what happens, even if they start the year against three great offenses. So when I was looking at the early season schedule and how those rankings uh, ended, look, the Vikings are one of my favorite defenses in the NFL, but I noticed that they get off – they have a uh, they have a really poor strength of schedule the, the, to open the first four weeks. So I took a look and saw, okay, if you draft the Vikings in your draft this year, you're going to get week one against the Falcons – an offense that I think we all would not want to play our fantasy defense no, against. Not excited. And week two against the Packers mm. and Aaron Rodgers and the new you know offense there. So I feel like I'm I'm going to bypass Minnesota in my drafts because I would I don't want the, either of those first two weeks. I'm not going to hold them for week three and beyond. They're I not would in rather, a category of like hold all year. Exactly. Right. So I mean I don't I don't know if anybody is necessarily usually one team is worth holding all year, maybe two, but it's not always the team you Chicago's, think it is. Chicago's probably the one to think about. I right. Mean, but yeah. that's it. Um and then, and then on the flip side, you know, what what team that maybe is mediocre but has a really good early strength of schedule, look, the the Dallas Cowboys, their defense isn't Oh, they're pretty good. Class, yeah, but they're pretty, pretty good. They're 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 middle of the road. But you want to know what I love playing against? Ooh, bad quarterbacks. <laughs> That's pretty much what I love. What about at. rookies? 
Oh, I love playing against rookie quarterbacks. Um, so the 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 Cowboys open the season against the Giants and Eli Manning without Odell Beckham, and they follow that up with the Redskins, which I don't care which quarterback they choose. I like either options against my fantasy defense. So those are some examples of like how you can utilize a strength of schedule tool for actual, you know, uh, pragmatic way to use it in your draft. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. And um, even when you're looking at the end of the season, even if you don't know what the turnover is going to be like for those defenses, you can get an idea and say, oh, wow, they're, they're, on, the, they're on the road three times or, you know, some different indications of uh, what may be a tiebreaker between a couple different defenses. Mm-hmm. Mike, what do you got for us? All right. Ultimate draft tip, Mike. This uh, can't just be a regular draft tip. I just want to be clear. Ooh. Must be Ultimates? ultimate. Yeah. Pull out your glove, snap your finger. What do you got? Well, all I do is bring things that are more ultimate -er. <sighs> Well, they, including Incredible. grammar, spelling. So I want to talk about reception perception. We are absolutely delighted to be the exclusive home of Matt Harmon's reception perception. Matt Harmon. Uh, one of the bright stars in the fantasy industry, currently working over at Yahoo Sports. And if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, what he has done is developed a methodology that he can take a look at wide receivers and see if they're actually a skilled wide receiver at creating separation independent of their quarterback. Because sometimes, you know, you get caught up in a wide receiver who had an awesome year and it turns out, well, he's not actually that good. The ball just happened to bounce the right way for him with opportunity and certain production. So he's looking at wide receivers. How good are they actually? And there is a, there's a ton of interesting information and a couple pieces I wanted to highlight. We all love Juju Smith-Schuster. In fact, he's up on our wall right now. There's a signed jersey of him. And we're all ready for Juju to take the next step. And right Which now, is supernova. The star's been born. <laughs> right now, it's supernova time. Well, Jason, I don't know if you know, know about that'd science. Dead, that'd be a you, dead star. You don't then, want right? that to happen. Uh, I want the supernova. I just don't want the post supernova. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you want the burst. I want the explosion. You don't want so, the, the dead core. Like right now, I'm I'm on board. I love Juju. I have him. He's my top five. I'm projecting huge things for him. And it, it for me, it's not so much the increase of targets. It's not the volume because he was. He was a humongous part of that passing game already. But the touchdowns, that was the number where it's easy to see him moving up. And what's interesting about him, if Juju, he's actually very bad against press coverage. He has been both years that he has been in the league. He crushes on the slant route, the dig route, and the flat route. Those are very short, uh, short routes. He owned the middle of the field. But on deeper routes and intermediate routes, his ability to create separation is has not been that great I mean he's spectacular at what he is good good with and that has led to last year 71 percent of his touchdowns came inside the red zone okay let's look at the, the guy who's gone Antonio Brown he wins everywhere there's absolutely no holes in Antonio Brown's game he's great at deep routes and Antonio who was a touchdown master only 46 percent of his touchdowns came in the red zone that means Antonio Brown was scoring rapidly from outside of the 20, huge plays. Can Juju actually fill that gap in the offense and take his touchdown level from seven to what we're hoping, where mm. you're talking 11, 12 touchdowns, if he's actually not that great at yet? And I'm just talking his career right now because he can certainly work his way up to being – a sensational downfield guy. That's what Antonio Brown did. But I'm just saying that is super interesting, and I hate you. Ex I didn't like. like it. I don't like this. I didn't like it either. <laughs> but it's very interesting, and we always say stay water. <laughs> Make sure you're always taking in more information. It's very good information. So I'm it was one of those things though. where it's like I haven't, I have not adjusted Juju yet. But this is this is the first time that I've had a a beam of light hit me in the eye, going, "Well, maybe I need to pause just a just a little, pump the brakes." Twice. Well, and if, full stop. It's interesting, too, just hearing it for the first time from you. It's interesting when you add a piece like Dante Moncrief, it, yes. who is known for scoring on yes. big-time plays. And we've seen this with the history of Ben Roethlisberger. 
they try to equip him with downfield threats, whether it was trying to do it with Martavis or Sammy Coates or even a guy like James Washington. You know, the, it's an interesting thing to say, hey, is Juju really going to fill that role? Right. And one of the things that we bring up in the Juju player profile video on Ultimate Draft Kit and when we've talked about him is the fact that his numbers were, were at the top end of what you can even achieve from a yardage perspective. Right, that's it's why just it's the touchdowns. It's touchdowns. Yeah. And yeah. it seemed like that should be an easy thing for him to go up. Maybe it won't be as easy hmm. a, as we were initially projecting. Uh, the other pair of wide receivers I wanted to highlight, Curtis Samuel versus DJ Moore. DJ Ooh. Moore of, of the Carolina Panthers. <laughs> what are we thinking about the I'm U.S. About a wedding the stop DJ? Sign. I know I'm thinking about the stop. Oh sign. right, so DJ Moore is kind of the the easy pick, the hot pick for the breakout wide receiver from the Carolina Panthers, a first round pick this past year. But people forget about Curtis Samuel, who was a second round pick just a couple years ago. Basically, missed a whole year, so he right. was practically and, on the same rookie level. And so we all forget how much we loved Curtis Samuel coming into the league. And then you break down his reception perception and Curtis Samuel has already taken the step to being a top notch route runner, making tons of separation, uh, which is probably pretty good for his quarterback. Cam Newton needs his <laughs> Cam, Cam needs some room needs his guys to be open. And that's what Curtis Samuel is doing so much. So that Matt Harmon referred to him as an early career, Stefan Diggs. That's what he was seeing. That's how hyped he was for seeing Curtis Samuel. Meanwhile, DJ Moore, who is, Harmon points out, he is excellent in the yards after catch. He had the best percentage of, of broken tackles when he's in open space. So he's still a sensational player, but he's still a young player. And he was not creating separation down the field. Meanwhile, Curtis Samuel was. So this is just one of those things. Let's take pause. It's easy to want to call DJ Moore the breakout, but do not forget there is another high draft capital player on that team who already has a little bit more experience. He Curtis Samuel could easily be the breakout player for that team. And I actually he, like both players, which is part of the reason I think Cam, if I mean, while Cam's healthy, he's going to be a good value this year. Well, and someone like Curtis Samuel then though looks like a strategic dynasty acquisition. Right. Because it's going to cost you a lot, and I know this from our leagues, to, to go after a DJ Moore because people see the ceiling of a DJ Moore first-round draft capital. You know, he's an explosive player. But you're not going to pay what you have to pay for DJ Moore when you go after Curtis Samuel. My, yeah, and my point is simply maybe we're a year away from DJ Moore. Sure. Maybe, maybe Moore will be that third year. Uh, right, like most wide receivers, and the last one I wanted to point out—it's just—it's pretty quick. It's Robbie Anderson because this—it's great when you can put like the eye test of watching a player. Uh, it's good. Like I, I, I rely on looking at talent, believing I can analyze and, and know if a player is actually talented. But sometimes it's great to have actual substance to that, and that's what reception perception is doing. And Robbie Anderson dominates. He is already he's one of the best deep threats in the league. And it's like, yeah, I know. But it's great to have actual concrete numbers, knowing that he is creating separation at an elite level. If Sam Darnold really does take that step like I'm projecting him to, with Adam Gase, who somehow carries the quarterback whisper moniker still to this day. He whispered but, Peyton Manning to greatness. <laughs> yeah, he like he's really lucky that he turned that the career of that Peyton Manning bum around. <laughs> the nice thing is, is most people give him credit for using players the right way. Right. So even if he's not perfect and, and we, why we like Robbie or at least Except why, for Kenyon Drake. why I love Robbie Anderson. Well, that's, we'll get to find out this year was yeah. Adam Gase, right? Uh, why I love Robbie Anderson is I'm, I'm calling for that next step for Sam Darnold, looking for him to push the ball downfield. And Robbie Anderson has those elite separation skills down the field. That's why I'm. That's why I have confidence in Robbie. So it's nice to see those things in actual data form instead of just my anecdotal, my, opinion, yeah, my observational, my opinion of watching him play. Look how fast he is. <laughs> yeah. Well, because we see isolated plays. You know, that's what happens with your eyes. You're not. Maybe you guys out there are watching every single route that Robbie Anderson runs. And that's what Harmon does. I was gonna say that's what Harmon does. Yeah. So it's like we see the highlights and we say, "Oh man, that guy looks like he's great." 
but it is neat to see that statistical evidence. I'm jumping into the red zone report with my next insight. Uh, a couple of shocking stats. Uh, I'll start with this one. Alvin Kamara, he owned the 10 zone. Now, the red zone's inside the 20, but we've got data in there on inside the 10 carries. I love it. I love being able to see how sticky these touchdown numbers really are. And it's so much more valuable than red zone. Yes. Red zone is such a dumb stat. Red, red zone, to me, works for wide receivers. Yes. But red zone does not work for running backs. I mean, there's huge amounts of evidence. The If you're running from the 11 to the 19-yard line, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. But from the 10 and in is unbelievably valuable. And Alvin Kamara, he owned it. He owned the 10 zone. 33 10 zone attempts last year, second most in the league, by behind Todd Gurley, by the way. 10 10 zone touchdowns. That's second in the league. So his touchdowns were coming from a more reliable, predictable depth. Right. It's why I have him. I, I, the Saints as the number one rushing team again this year in terms of touchdowns. 71% of Kamara's touchdowns came inside the 10. That is repeatable. That is something that was, I think, a little bit surprising because people expected you know, them to go right back to the well with Mark Ingram and giving him those opportunities. No, they said, Alvin Kamara's just too good. He just gets in. He's just too good. And I don't think that Latavius Murray, while he will supplement, is going to do anything different by way of inside the 10 work than Mark Ingram would do. So that was insight number one, Alvin Kamara's sticky touchdown rate. This one was even more shocking. And, and part of this, I'm not even going to draw a conclusion here. I'm going to let you guys draw the conclusion. Oh, okay. Because that's a lot of what the I ultimate got... draft kit's about. Listen to this. Devontae Adams had more than twice the amount of red zone targets than Mike Evans had last year. So Devontae Adams had 31. Makes sense. Mike Evans had 14. But get this. Mike Evans had only six total red zone receptions last season. Michael Thomas had 24. Josh Reynolds had seven. That is more than Mike Evans had. Ooh. Mike Evans did not have a lot of opportunity in the red zone last year whatsoever. When you can turn in a season like he had with six red zone receptions, what do you make of that data? What do you make of that observation? Uh, two things. It says room to go up for red zone work because Mike Evans is a great red zone player. He's had years where he's dominated in that area of the field. Uh, it also speaks a little bit to some of the deep plays that were happening. I mean, you don't get in the red zone when you're scoring Ryan Fitzpatrick magic from the 50-yard <laughs> line. That's true. That's true. I just think it's very interesting when you look at what makes um, variance at the touchdown position – you look at Devontae Adams and you say 31 targets inside the red zone. Oh, that's why every single year Devontae Adams leads or is near the lead of the NFL in touchdowns. The opportunities, success in that space. Even Michael Thomas, that's a good number to know that, you know, 24 red zone receptions, right. some of those are going to end up in the end zone. Someone like Mike Evans, it just seems like there is nowhere to go but up in terms of red zone targets. I feel and like if this team is going to be more successful through Bruce Arians' offense, even if it's not, you know, exponential how do you not throw it to the big guy i feel like this is data that we just need to get over to the tampa bay buccaneers oh yeah I well think, brooks because because i'm looking put your through, clothes on through mike send evans an email out to bruce <laughs> i mean it hit just historically speaking his his red zone reception numbers they're just not where they should be at all i mean tampa bay get mm -hmm. it together he is humongous yeah oj <laughs> howard's looking over and winking at you though going <laughs> Yeah, uh, OJ. maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, OJ Howard looks at Mike Evans and goes, humongous. Yeah. That, <laughs> Who are you that talking little, to? That baby guy. That little guy. All right, so, Brooks. Interesting. Uh, Brooks, do me a favor. Uh, hold off on putting those clothes on because Wait. I got to give you huge credit here, Bongo player. Uh, what I'm going to bring up now is one of my favorite things that, that we have on our website at all. I absolutely love them. It's, it's our consistency charts. This is a Brooks creation. Years ago, Brooks was doing this on his own in a Google Doc, and uh, you know we we started looking at this data and using it, being like, "Wow, this is really valuable data. We should give it to the people." So we we made that. If you're uh, in the join the foot, you see the week by week consistency charts through the year. And what these are is these are charts where you can see how a player finished at the position, not just how many points they scored, but like 
How often fantasy finish? Fantasy finish. Are they are they a top twelve? Are they a top twenty four? Are they a bust? And it's this color coded grid that just makes it really quick and easy to scroll through and look for anomalies, look for things that stand out. Then we also take it and we look at percentages. Like Corey Davis say, never being green. <laughs> right. You'd be like, oh, man, why is there only two green yeah. uh, boxes here? So here's two quick little things that stood out to me. Tom Brady's the GOAT. <laughs> right, Tom. Tom Brady is sure. great. He's fantastic. Uh, you know, going to go down as the best quarterback of all time, and he has been a very successful fantasy football quarterback in the past. That's why people still draft him and use him high and all that. Last year, he still finished, uh, you know, as as a decent quarterback. But if you actually look at how it happened on a weekly basis, you start to see a trend here because in the last ten. The, the last 10 weeks of the season, Tom Brady only had a top 12 quarterback two times. Now, keep in mind, you're in a 12-man league. Pretty much you need a top 12 performance every right. week. Either you spend a high draft capital on a quarterback who you think almost every week is going to get a top 12 so you could compete with the other 11 teams in the league, or you're streaming the position so you're playing the matchups to get you know well north of 50% in that top 12. That means eight of the last 10 weeks, he wasn't a top 12, which killed you in fantasy. Right. So, like, when I look at that, and that's kind of the trend, I'm going, okay, I'm off of Tom Brady. I'm not I'm not drafting Tom Brady. They're, they're going even more run heavy. They lost Gronk. So, that's that's where I'm at on, on Tom Brady. The other one that stood out to me, and this was just I, – I like – Yeah, you actually excla – you exclaimed – Allowed in the office when you discovered this. I did. Very distracting. Well, because I just I love distracting people. Yeah, that's why. Um, <laughs> but so I really you're so like, good at it. Thank you. I really like the consistency percentages as well because sometimes we forget when a player misses games how good they were or bad they were when they were on the field. And as I looked at the 2018 consistency percentages. O.J. Howard, the aforementioned gigantic man from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, he had a higher consistency percentage of finishing in the top 12 on a weekly basis than Zach Ertz, George Kittle, or Eric Ebron last year. So when we're talking about the potential breakout here for O.J. Howard, now that Adam Humphreys is gone and Deshaun Jackson's He kind Jackson, of already broke out percentage-wise. I mean, most of his weeks, 80% of his weeks last year, he was wow. a top 12 tight end. That's great. And so... He just needs more weeks. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, <laughs> stay healthy, your knees. I, you that's interesting. It is interesting. Weeks. So more weeks. I'm, I'm a big fan of O.J. Howard this year. I think he's going to have a great breakout. He'll be one of those, you know... Top five drafted tight ends for the next five or six years. Yeah, that's, that's my opinion. Interesting. Mike, you, you uh, can close out the ultimate draft tips here. Sure. So the people ask us very frequently you know, how to use the kit. I feel like we've done a pretty good jo job here of highlighting some of the ways we use it. And then, But how do you use it to actually draft? And that's when you talk about tears, baby. Tears. If you go look at our rankings, you will find – the 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 projection score that we think that person will hit with with their stats their risk rating you know which is the risk rating is how confident are you in that projection because this person this person may have a lot of variables yeah. happening around them injury or, or, depth chart yes. history so that's what the risk rating is all about and then you will see these players are grouped into tiers now if you're not familiar with this the, the, this is how we think about players when we're drafting them. We put them in a bucket. So, and inside of this bucket are players who we believe will score very similar. Uh, end of season, their their points will be very similar to one another. That helps you separate yourself from the name where you freak out. You're like, I got to get Andrew Luck, or, you, or even the rank. Oh, he's three sure. spots behind this other player. You're like, I've got to get this player. I got to get Andrew Luck, and then you realize that we have Deshaun Watson, who's ranked behind Andrew Luck, but scoring a very similar amount of points. He's in the same tier, but Deshaun Watson's going a full round behind Andrew Luck. So you're looking at, well, I can get similar point produ production going later in the draft. So that's 
I feel like that's a snapshot. Have, have I missed anything explaining tears? No, I, I think that you covered it, and it's just a philosophical way of approaching the draft that gives you an advantage over other players. You you, you never put yourself in a position of desperation when you were drafting strategically yes. using tears. Well, it, it helps you not draft uh, afraid. And then I I looked through – Which you always make the worst picks when you're afraid. You do. When you draft just, tilts – it's the worst. We've all done it. And oh, you know, everyone has. I'll just say this. We all have. And when you make one bad draft pick, it's like it's required by law to make the next two really bad, too. Yes. It's like you've tilted you on that one. Ball. Then you realize you made it, and then you try to make up for it, and you get out of hand. So there, there was a couple players that I just wanted to point out real quick that uh, along with we have guys who we have designated as these are values that all three of us believe in. We can look at the projections and find your own values based off of these tiers like Julian Edelman for us he is a tier three wide receiver and you can see the ADP data in here that he's going a full round behind all the other at least a full round behind all these other wide receivers ding, 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 ding. who are in that same tier Sammy Watkins much to Andy's chagrin so this is more of a Jason Moore Mike Wright special mm -hmm. we got him in our tier five and he's going at the back of the seventh I call him round. Sammy Sadness but go on. Sammy's sadness? Yeah. Yeah, go on. All right. And then the aforementioned, because I can't stop talking about Robbie Anderson. Oh, I love that man. But he's in. He's at the top of tier six, and he is going in the eighth round. Meanwhile. Robbie happiness? Is that who you're talking about? <laughs> wow, you are crushing right now. You're on fire. <laughs> but so, like, he's at the top of that tier going in the eighth round. Meanwhile. All the other players in that tier are in the fifth or the sixth yeah. round. So yeah. this is this is helping you strategize how you're going to attack the attack your draft. Put these guys into tiers. It's extremely helpful. A couple points to add to that: we do have a brand new cheat sheet creator that features tiers, and your tiers are dynamically updated based on your scoring system. Yeah. So when you plug in whatever idiosyncrasies your league scoring has. The tiers are dynamically and algorithmically adjusted, and you will have a, a very up-to-date, perfect draft day cheat sheet for those of you like myself who likes to print out a piece of paper, who likes to reference his cheat sheet. And uh, I like you know, I get the Sharpie out. So that's the way Dad did it. Look, yeah, the that's way, the way Dad does it. The way that... <laughs> The way that draft day smells like a sharpie. That's all I'm saying. I I'm I'm actually and, right and there. Hot that's weird. And hot wings. It smells like wings and yeah, and hot wings. I'm actually so there with you. I feel like I draft best with a printed cheat sheet where I can look at everyone at once, cross players off. Like uh, and I, last I, year, the, the, they were not nearly what they are this year. Oh, this year, way it's better. a one. It's a one sheet. We make it easy. Yep. So very excited again tomorrow, today, last two days that you can get. The Ultimate Draft Kit at pre-order pricing. We want you in there. We want you to enjoy it. It's updated all off-season, and that is ultimatedraftkit.com. And if you do play DFS, there is a combo available to get the DFS Pass, which is our in-season DFS helper. Oh, I'm so excited for this year. Uh, yeah, we got a lineup generator coming this year to the DFS Pass. We've added some top-notch yes. writers to the articles. Like the Top men. I, I mean, this <laughs> the DFS side is going to be awesome and it's right now if you're getting the combo it's it's a ridiculous deal considering what dfs costs elsewhere i will i will close out the show saying this there is a high probability and take whatever precautions are necessary that you will be naked playing bongos by the time you get into the <laughs> ultimate draft all right game. all right all right of the day. all right today's pristine deal of the day a deandre hopkins signed houston texans jersey Yesterday on Pristine Auction sold for $58.97. Another steal on Pristine Auction. Hundreds of daily sports memorabilia auctions. Memorabilia. That was like my Mark Ingram yesterday. There might be some Mark Ingram gear on there. PristineAuction.com. When you sign up, which is totally free, if you use the registration code BALLERS, you get five bucks into your account for a future auction purchase. So that is just free money. We, we talked to them. We said, uh, we want you to give our listeners free money. And they did. And they, they were like, okay. Uh, it took them a little while, but they were like, yeah. sure. And so you can do that at pristineauction.com with the registration code BALLERS. That is it for today's episode, fellas. We did it. We, we did made it. it through. I'm so excited for draft season. Yeah, it's, it's getting really fun. It's really coming fun. soon. Hey, we will see you next week. Thank you for tuning in. 
Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.